Hello, wonderful people. I'm happy to be here again on PM Personality Profile. My guest tonight needs no introduction. He's the longest serving General Secretary of the National Democratic Congress, the most controversial politician I know. He says if he gets into your skin, not even the mosquito repellent can save you. He's currently the chairman of the NDC. I'm sure by now you know I'm talking about none other but the general himself, Johnson Asiyo Dunketi, affectionately called General Mosquito. I'm so excited that we could have this conversation. <laughs> How long has it been? Why do you oh, have years? <laughs> about uh, more than a year at least. Uh, since Interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I know you've had a few uh, opportunities to explain how this name General Mosquito came about. But mm. for the sake of my viewers, mm. tell me, how did you get this uh, title? Well, in a lot of sense, I would say it was imposed on me. <laughs> by, by who? My comrades in NPP. Okay. Because uh, they found me very difficult uh -huh. to compromise. Okay. And, and I stuck to principle and get what I want. Okay. Uh, it all happened uh, when uh, somewhere in 2001 when uh, President Kofu had them taken over and setting up his government so he nominated uh, ministers for uh, vetting okay. and i happened to be on the appointments committee <laughs> <laughs> and i did my work so diligently that <laughs> i could not be moved to do things that i thought were wrong yeah and so uh, from the beginning i enjoyed the support of my caucus but as the controversy raged, uh, they started abandoning me one by one. <laughs> <laughs> so in the end, I was left standing alone <laughs> against <laughs> the other side. But I persisted and I got a particular minister disqualified, nominee disqualified. Because the whole story was about a nominee whose background suggests that uh, he couldn't be trusted. Uh, he has been dismissed from his workplace for stealing. Mm. And then he managed to get to parliament on the MPP ticket. Wow. And then uh, he got to be nominated to become a minister. And say, as for minister, I think the it is way. not on. <laughs> so I fought and fought and fought. And I managed to go to his workplace and got hold of his uh, confidential file. Okay. Uh -huh. So when they were threatening me all over, you know, my friends in MPP, they can threaten you, do this to you, sue you, <laughs> you do this, produce evidence and so on. Uh, incidentally, the appointment committee was being chaired by uh, Freddie Blay, okay. uh, who was the deputy speaker of parliament. Then, yeah. So. It was all over the place, threatening and so on. So I was actually up against powerful principalities, <laughs> but I prevailed. <laughs> and so that was the time uh, the civil wars in <laughs> Liberia and Sierra Leone were raging. Okay. And there was this uh, rebel leader called General Mosquito. <laughs> 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 so MPP felt that. <laughs> I was uh, so much of a non-conformist, <laughs> so they may succeed in dampening my spirit by giving, giving me such a nickname <laughs> and so on. So, uh, but I'm a teacher, okay. so I adopted it. <laughs> and of course, yes. I can see. And now, I mean, I know <laughs> at least more than... 100 people across the country calling themselves General Mosquito. Oh, it's now <laughs> become a famous <laughs> name. Uh, precisely, yes. <laughs> Interesting. But mm. I can see you look fantastic. And you've been mm. busy uh, for some time now well, going around. Thank you. Um, gaining support for your candidates uh, yeah. for the upcoming general elections. How has yeah. it been so far? Well, the actual campaigning hasn't started yet. Yeah. We are at a stage where you know, we are um, like listening to the people. Yeah. 
we adopted that procedure during the 2020 elections and so our manifesto was built largely on the expectations of people. the people we hope to govern mm. and so uh, but we didn't get the opportunity to implement that manifesto so we thought that four years is some sufficient time when things have changed and so on so yeah. let's go and revisit uh, uh, you know the manifesto and yeah. see which aspects are still relevant uh, which other things have come on board because of uh, emerging challenges and so on yeah. so we can revise it and okay. then put it before the people so that is what we have talking uh, about the people's manifesto brings about the much talked about 24-hour economy yeah. versus your candidates opponents blue economy mm -hmm. uh, the there's been questions about its implementation how much will be involved in terms of infrastructure mm -hmm. to support the policy mm -hmm. do you have answers sure our opponents are just blowing hot air because that policy appears to have taken them by storm and so their reaction suggests that uh, they are this uh, this is not a complicated policy to adopt or implement at all. Okay. Let me bring just a few aspects down to the level of viewers and listeners, and then they will understand where we are coming from. You see, industries in Europe and many other places operate 24 hours True. and we are operating eight hours and we are supposed to produce things and compete with somebody who is utilizing his infrastructure everything for 24 hours yeah. so there is from the beginning a disconnect that makes us uncompetitive if we just look at the surface like that you understand so what we are saying is that the, there is already some infrastructure that is being underutilized mm -hmm. or badly utilized. Mm -hmm. Let's take our uh, energy infrastructure for instance. You see that Ghana is one place where you have uh, so much variance between a low period of energy consumption and peak period of energy consumption okay. within any day. Mm -hmm. There are times when there is peak period, let's for the purpose of argument, take maybe a scale of zero to 100. There are times you see that energy consumption in some parts of the day may come to 10%. 10 there are other times, peak periods, when you see that the energy consumption has shot up to 90%. So that variation exists in how we consume our electricity. Mm -hmm. Now, if you get into another economy where they are running 24-hour shift, you see that this variation has been evened out. So instead of maybe varying from 10% to 90%, you have a variation of around 50%. Mm. So it may come down to 40, it may go down to 60. Yep. And then that is how the electricity will be consumed. Mm. Now take these two scenarios and see how much it, it costs to fix the infrastructure for electricity uh, distribution. You don't want, you want 24 hour supply of electricity. So you don't want a, a scenario where during the peak period there is overload and your system will shut down. Shut down, yeah. Okay. So in putting, in laying the infrastructure, you must, lay, you must lay it in such a way that it can capture the peak period 
and you still have no problems. Okay. So if you are procuring and installing transformers, uh, power cables, and so on, you need to be buying what will be able to carry the 90. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Even though you will be, and in fact, you will not just leave it at 90. <laughs> you, you buy that which will carry 100. So that even when you get to 90, your system will not be disrupted. Mm. But most of the day, you see that you are below 50. Okay. Mm -hmm. So all the rest from 50 to 100 well, is just a excess. waste. It's just excess. But you need to provide it if you want to have a system that, that will Runs, not shut down yeah, during peak period. So if you have another economy where um, the consumption variation is between 40 and 60, 40 and 60, you buy the equipment that will take you to maybe 70. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Which is cheaper than what you are providing at 30. And because the system is utilized throughout the day, mm. you find out that the numbers or the economies of it it's far better. You don't have a lot of, uh, you know, capacity that you will not be using and, 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 and all that. Yeah. So from that standpoint alone, if you are able, as a matter of policy, to encourage some of the consumers to offload their consumption during peak period yeah. to the, the low period of 10, and you are able to push that one up, yeah. you bring down the peak uh, numbers, and then you, you, you better have uh, you know, better advantages, and better utilization yeah. of your facility. Mm -hmm. So if you are implementing 24-hour economy, and some of the huge energy con consumers like uh, uh, the steel mills that use a lot of electricity, you encourage them to, to be uh, the, the cement uh, factories and other things. You encourage them to be working during the, the off-peak periods. Yeah. Then they will utilize more of the energy, which otherwise you will not be utilizing. Mm -hmm. So it makes good sense to even reduce the tariffs yeah. for them because it inures to the benefits of the Compass. whole economy. Yeah. It inures to the benefits of the uh, the power sector and so on. Mm. So by giving them cheap power, <laughs> which could have gone waste anyway. Anyway, yeah. You are introducing efficiency into the, the utilization of your energy resources and mm. so on. Mm. Take the the main routes in Accra. Mm -hmm. As you were coming, because it was morning. Yeah. You see that driving from 37 to this place the 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 road was virtually empty mm -hmm. but when you check the other side yeah. because everybody is driving to work yeah you see that there is huge traffic, traffic. jam mm. okay sure if why because everybody is going to work at eight o'clock <laughs> in the morning and close at five o'clock mm -hmm. so in the morning the traffic flow is towards the center of Accra. Mm -hmm. So half of the road is choked, the other half is free. free. Yep. So your solution could be that, oh, then let's add one lane, two more lanes, and, and so on. Yeah. But still, it will take you just a few years to get that one also choked. Mm -hmm. What happens if, for instance, you are able to do some policy intervention where while some people will be going to work this morning, others are returning from work. So there is distribution of traffic evenly on those lanes. Okay. You don't need to provide extra, <laughs> what do you call it? Extra lane to be able to ease the traffic and so on. So that time may be too short to go into this, thing, but these are practically some of the things. Mm you look at and then a company that is running uh, eight hours 
and shutting down, everybody goes to sleep. Yeah. As against a company where you run three shifts or two shifts, while these people are going home, the work is taken over by another set. While the equipment should be lying idle, they are being utilized. Then when they are also going home, another set is coming. Right. So you see that you can use three sets of employees to keep your equipment working throughout. Right. It doesn't mean that every company or every institution is set up to do that. Yeah. But this one favors, you know, particular manufacturing and other services. There are certain services that yeah. are cut mm -hmm. to, to, to uh, tap into this type of uh, uh, arrangement. So when you go to Europe or America and so on, you t take the economy. Some of them are running maybe 30%, 24-hour economy, depending mm -hmm. upon their industrial setup. Yeah. Some are running 20% and, and, and all that. Mm -hmm. So that's all we want to uh, bring in, mm. okay? Because if you have the same overheads and one factory is running three shifts, maybe tripling its output, then the overheads, when you sh share the overheads over the products, yeah. you see that their production costs will come down. Okay. But if if you take one shift and then with the same overheads, you see that the one who is running three shifts in manufacturing items, the cost will come down. The cost will come down with those who are running three shifts, yep. as opposed to those who run one shift, Only one shift. and close down. Every equipment uh, has a lifespan. There are some where you provide for depreciation and all that. And then they say you can run this thing for uh, uh, five years and, and, and all that. Somebody who is utilizing the equipment almost 24 hours a day, and you who are using it eight hours in every 24 hour shift, when you get to five years, who would have utilized the equipment better? The three shift. The three shift. So these are practical, you know, Examples, and I hear people shouting, uh, uh, I mean, but what amuses me, for instance, <laughs> is that I hear somebody saying, <laughs> chop bars run 24 <laughs> hours. <laughs> if all other people go to sleep, who will be eating midnight, fufu midnight? Of course. Eh? Yeah. So, on the one leg, you are saying that the thing is no good. On the other side, you are saying that it is being implemented. Now, if it is not good and it is being implemented, why didn't you cancel it? <laughs> <laughs> you understand? Yeah. And in every economy, there are essential services that by their nature already run 24 hours. Yeah. You know. Mm -hmm. And they are, they are there. They don't shut down. Yeah. Even when you go to government services, there are areas where the customer base it's high. You can look at the possibility of introducing the three hour, uh, the, the, uh, three shift the three shift system. system. Go to our courts now. Look at the backlog of cases. Yep. That creates the impression that our judicial system is not functioning. Mm. Because if a businessman has a business issue to be dealt with, time is money. In business, recently then they've introduced weekends, uh, holidays. Uh -huh. So at least that you know, tells you the, the wisdom in the the, <laughs> the twenty four hour. <laughs> if you have sets of judges who will be sitting uh, using Even the same, the, yes, okay, because the night doesn't stop you thinking, <laughs> does it? <laughs> you see, so if we have a system where even judges can sit at night. Okay. and help clear all this backlog of, lock of cases. Mm. If anybody is coming to invest in the economy and he knows that when he runs into uh, a business dispute, the matter can be dealt with expeditiously. Mm. 
What he choose that economy to invest rather than going to where cases will be in court for 10 years, uh, uh, by which time, uh, you know, his investment proposals would have gone stale. Okay. See, so these are some of the things. Look at the backlog of uh, cases at the passport office, for instance. Mm. Yeah. We are introducing technology and you see we are going the guitar, passport, the guitar application, the application that. When you apply online, the, uh, the, the constraining point is the printing and delivery of the passport. You can all apply online. Mm -hmm. If the one who is printing the passports for you to be able to get it expeditiously works eight hours and closes and go home, then come another day, works eight hours, closes and go home. As opposed to another system where one shift will be doing the printing, I mean, this eight hours. In the night, of course, clients may not be coming to... Uh, pick or whatever. So throughout the other 16 hours where we couldn't be going to office, if there are workers who will be processing all the, the applications documents. and so on, so the following morning all the passports are ready for picking. Or when you go to the ports, you know that if a businessman uh, does importation of raw materials or uh, any other imports or exports, yeah of perishable goods and all that. If you look at making the ports work 24 hours, how many, uh, how many cargo ships will go into demorage and, and all that with extra expenditure and, and all that? So there are a lot of things when you say 24 hours, we are not going to compel everybody by law go and do 24 hours. But when the policy is rolled out, you will see the business sense in signing up to it. Mm. And it will be a win-win situation. Oh, Government right. will win and businesses will win. And when businesses are able to win and have profit, mm. they expand and create more jobs. Great. All right, so let's talk about digitalization. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Baumia says he's the master of the game. Mm -hmm. Can your candidates match him? Who is the godfather of digitalization in Ghana, apart Tell from me. President John Dramani Mahama? Tell me about it. You know, all this noise about digitalization, it all started under President John Dramani Mahama as the Minister for Communication. You know, in the past, we used to have Ministry for uh, posts and telecommunication. Okay. Okay. It was when President Mahama became a minister that these two portfolios were separated because there was opportunity for expansion in the telecommunication and the ICT sector. Okay. So, John Ramani Mahama was actually the grandfather of this whole digitalization. And when he became president, go and check the records. And his investments in laying the infrastructure for ICT in this country. So, when you come and you, you have, I mean, government is a continuum. So there's nothing wrong with coming to utilize infrastructure that has been laid by your predecessor to build upon. But you don't claim ownership of digitalization in Ghana. So if you are talking about digitalization, then Bahumia doesn't come anywhere close to Mahama. But it's like one person laying the infrastructure, another person beginning to utilize the infrastructure for something because of the fact that the one who laid the infrastructure uh, is not positioned now to be able to mm. utilize it. So you have come to inherit something 
if you are building upon it or you are utilizing it, don't claim ownership. And in any case, Baumia was not brought on board this economy because of his expertise in ICT or digitalization or that. We all know why Baumia was brought. <laughs> why? The one who brought him actually told us Ghanaians that he does not have expertise in building the economy. And that is why he has taken the trouble to look for Dr. Baumia and picked him from Bank of Ghana. Because Dr. Baumia at Bank of Ghana, as deputy governor at that time, was responsible for all the economic successes under President Kufo. Okay. And that was how he has brought him up to make him the chairman of the economic management team mm. so that he can help build what he called at that time a shattered economy. But isn't the that digitalization was part of please, building the economy? Uh, it's part of it, but that is not the reason why he was brought. <laughs> so he was brought there and he was chairman of our economic management team. He continues to be chairman of the economic management team. And the thing started going from bad to worse till the point we have reached. Now he's not mentioning economy at all. <laughs> <laughs> if I employ you, <laughs> I employ you to come and work on my farm. And I say, well, can you cook? Uh, stop working and uh, maybe cook for your colleagues so that after that you come and work. Then you have shifted from the purpose from which you came to the farm and you are now organizing a job bar on my farm. But the man is talking about so, um, uh, the paperless port system. He's talking about um, uh, our, uh, what do you call it, the Momo pay and all of that. My, he's talking about <laughs> e-economy. And you say he, he, he's not... Is he not running away from his own e-levy now? <laughs> eh? Is he? Yes. <laughs> His spokesperson has come out to say that Baumia never supported the E-Levy. Okay. But the time it was being introduced, it was like Baumia bringing some magic to, to generate money, to pay our contractors, to pay all our arrears in this, school feeding, that. And now that they have seen that the E-Levy is not delivering the resource they intended. Mm. The National Women Organizer of MPP has come on television to swear that Baumia is not responsible for the e-levy at all. He never supported it at cabinet. And then uh, <laughs> Baumia and Osla, the minister for <laughs> <laughs> communication. <laughs> communication, they were the two people who never supported e-levy. <laughs> uh, say, who brought e-levy then? Mm. You understand? So the finance minister. Ah, <laughs> but ELV is about digitalization and digital way of raising revenue. Mm -hmm. So if the resource is coming or not coming, and you are now shifting that one to somebody else. <laughs> you see, the challenge we have, two challenges we have in this country. One is that we tend to focus on policy intentions. We judge policies by our intentions rather than the outcomes of policy. So it is only in Ghana where you hear that what are you doing to solve this problem? And they begin talking about the huge amount of state resources they have invested in that activity and not talking about the results of that policy mm. you understand yeah. today if you ask them uh, what are they doing to uh, generate employment or to boost industry oh when do one f <laughs> we have spent so much money in uh, establishing hundred and something. I've forgotten that their figures keep changing. Factories across the country. 
So that is sufficient to convince Ghanaians that they are doing a lot on the industrial scene. <laughs> but go and look at their own budget. And the growth of industry in Ghana has reported in their budget. Industry has declined so badly in an environment where you claim to be spending money to build industry. Why do you spend that money? You spend that money because you want to build industry, generate employment, reduce our imports, and so on. All the things you intended under the 1D1F are getting worse, apart from the monies you claim you have put there. Can't we charge you for wasting state resources? That is a thing. So when you are looking at fight against corruption, they will come out and say, we have financed the anti-corruption institutions better than any other government. We have pumped this amount of money. We have pumped that amount of money. What is the outcome? So if you have pumped that amount of resource into solving a problem, and the result is that the problem is getting worse, are you in good management? Hmm. You are not. You are, you are just there spending money. So let us begin to refocus on policy outcomes rather than policy intentions and the monies we waste in there. Planting for food and jobs. Where is the food and where are the jobs? The minister says uh, it's not what food, the minister food is says. now cheap. Oh, <laughs> on the market. so but Joy Farm can look at the market <laughs> prices <laughs> and to see whether the food is cheap or food is not cheap. <laughs> you see, so the more you plant, I like how Adongo put it. <laughs> is it Adongo? Not Adongo. Uh, uh, Hagan, okay. my MP for Cape Coast. Rick is Hagan. Rick is Hagan, not Hagan. <laughs> He said, the more you plant, the less you harvest. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what, is, what, is the, 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 what are the jobs and what are the, 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 uh, what is the food? Go and check the inflation figures. And you see that the main driver of inflation now is food prices. Yeah. So if the minister is telling you that he has brought food prices down, is it credible? <laughs> so it takes us to the second problem. That is trust between government and the government. That yeah. trust is at its lowest ebb. That's why you want us to boot the NPP I told out you the last time in you interviewed me. You remember we discussed this and I said that one of the biggest problems we have in the country is the lack of trust between government and the government. But you want the because people... leadership is about trust. If you trust your leaders, then you are in good business. Okay. Whatever they request of you, you do it with confidence mm -hmm. that they won't lead you down in a ditch. But we have been led down the ditches so many times that nobody now trusts them. Mm. And so even if they are bringing anything new, the trust you have in the people to believe in it and then to help implement it, it's not there. But the NPP and says a leader, you are not an alternative. A leader who has no followers He's just taking a walk. He's not a leader. He's not leading anything. <laughs> <laughs> you see? He's just taking a walk. You must be followed by the people you are leading. It's true. That's why you are called a leader. Mm. But now, nobody trusts in anything that comes out of the mouth of any person in government. How so we have come to the time that that... And, and when you breach trust so many times that the trust is destroyed. It becomes extremely difficult to restore. And so the point we have reached is that we cannot rely on the same people who created the problem in the first place to solve it. And they are not trustworthy anything they tell you 
when they say good morning, look at the position of the sun before you respond. <laughs> it, could as well, it could as well <laughs> be the evening and they are greeting you good morning. The, the NPP so says that, that assuming without admitting mm. that they are what you say they are, mm. but you are not an option for Ghanaians. Oh, why are you going to ask the one who has failed? <laughs> 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 whether his replacement, he should judge his, uh, the, his possible replacement. <laughs> He'll tell you he's still better. <laughs> so I'm not expecting anything different from them. Mm. And I like it when I hear this from them. Mm. Because the people don't trust them anymore. Mm. So when they say something is black, the people know that it is white. How do you intend to reignite that trust you say that has been broken the in trust the trust. When the people change, when the leadership change, when there is a breach of trust between leadership and the led, one must uh, leave. The people cannot leave. So the leadership will leave. When a new leadership comes, there will be that trust. You remember when I was being interviewed in your studio? I don't know whether it is you or Evans. Okay. When we were contemplating on going for the IMF package and so on, mm. I made the strong point that there are certain phases that must leave government immediately. Okay. If they are not there, and new phases come, they have the chance to reignite the trust. You see. But people who have said that, let us do this, it will help us, we did it we went into the ditch. Then they come, let us do this second time, it will help us, it went into the ditch. About 10 times. When they come and say that, this is the 11th magic, let us all go and do it, who will follow them? So I did say that finance minister at that time couldn't be relied upon to push any reforms because of that breach of trust. Mm. And I mentioned certain ministers which, if I were the president, I would have uh, fired, all of them. fired already, <laughs> bring new faces. Okay. They didn't agree. I was the one who raised it first. Then later, President Mahama joined in. Then later, MPs joined in, led by the MPs from the majority side, from the MPP side. Mm. You are in government and your, all your MPs say that, do this this way. And you say, no, I will do it my own way. <laughs> well, it's so not all the MPs. Where is the <laughs> it's No, but if MPs. you have 70 or so <laughs> MPs coming out to tell you <laughs> that, look, <laughs> this your minister is ABC, let's do this. You, 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 you will not help yourself if you just take that one lightly. So the NDC has mm -hmm. what it takes to restore the hopes of Ghanaians? Go and ask the Ghanaians. I'm telling you that now this campaign is seen as a struggle for Ghanaians to regain their independence. Okay. And that independence After struggle independence struggle must be led by President Mahama and his NDC. It mm. is coming from Ghanaians, it's mm. not coming from us. Yeah. We are at a place now where it is not just about government in, uh, as per the executive. Our state institutions have been messed up so badly that the lack of trust has extended into some state institutions and is gradually eating into virtually all the state institutions. And that is bad for us. Mm. Go and pick a state institution of governance that should play a key role in a democracy. Ask the people in that institution or conduct a survey in the whole country and let them tell you the trust they have in that state institution. And the results will, will vindicate what I'm talking about. Mm. You understand? If you have a state where the midwives for government, that is the Electoral Commission, has conducted itself in such a way that
majority of Ghanaians have lost trust in it. And as at the time, the indicators started coming out that Ghanaians have lost trust. Subsequent actions have sought to even deepen the mistrust. When these Afrobarometer surveys and then uh, the national security strategy document came out flagging the mistrust in our electoral system by the population, when those documents or survey reports were published, Apia Hene and the other three other people who were appointed, they had not been appointed. Mm. And then instead of listening, and if you have the opportunity, correct what the population perceived to be wrong. You go and deepen it by appointing known apparatchiks of your party onto the electoral commission. Are you deepening the trust or you are destroying the remaining trust? That's a problem. There is a popular perception in this country that the courts are being packed. Almost every year, appointment of new judges. Today, as we are talking, there are already three <laughs> that are going to face uh, this thing. Uh, Last uh, year, Lincoln. they appointed three more and so on. And many of these appointees have question marks when it comes to political neutrality. So go and ask the citizens. They will tell you that the courts are being packed by, with MPP operatives. Okay. Auditor General changed. The court should decide whether Auditor General could be changed or not. They took so long that by the time they decided that the Auditor General should not be changed, that verdict was useless. <laughs> you understand? You put a, a replacement Auditor General. He comes out with audit report of how you mess up with the resources that came to Ghana through the uh, COVID. And you are fighting, disputing <laughs> that report. Ah, you brought that person. You thought he was, <laughs> he was, he, he, he was better than Dominable. So if your own person has produced this report, what would have happened if you had a neutral person? So it means that you could have about one third worse things that could not be brought up. Look at what happened at Bank of Ghana, which led to that huge demonstration. Nothing has happened. The governor came and, uh, and, and then, uh, you know, spoke the way he liked. And, and they think that is all. You saw how the governor couldn't go to parliament during the budget <laughs> reading. Is that how you run an economy? You see, so I can pick on all these state institutions. Go to the security services. All the established methods for recruitment and all these things, they were compromised, got party, people, vigilante people, all recruited into the security service. Of late, I've heard that they are back trying to uh, insist on stricter means of recruitment. But the damage has been done. The people who are inside there already, if the vigilantes are inside, and you are now pretending to be doing the right things, what do you do to the people who are inside there? And if you have a security system in which people can claim openly that we are the NDC faction, we are the MPP faction. How can they combine to repel any attack <laughs> from our external enemies? They will spend more of the time fighting against each other or undermining each other. Because if you point a, a, a chief of defense staff and there is a significant chunk of military people 
who believe that the person is brought because of political reasons and he's sending people to war. Mm. They will be fighting each other. So Some will actually look at the, the, the proof that is happening uh, about IGP. Mm. Yep. It's, it is clear the police service is also divided along party lines. Mm. And somebody who is like could be second or third in command comes to openly declare that IGP is a wrong choice because he could not manipulate the security in Asin North to deliver victory to MPP. And so that is the yardstick of, of judging the IGP's performance. So it tells you that even within the top hierarchy of the security, they think that their first loyalty is to the government and not to the state. And that is dangerous for us. Mm. Quite interesting. <laughs> and the matter of a running mate has also come up, whether mm. female or male. I mean, what do you think? <laughs> Which running mate best suits I thought this interview candidate? was about personality profile. Definitely. It's now getting I into can't talk running mates. <laughs> the chairman and not talk about <laughs> <laughs> the party he supervises, definitely. <laughs> yes. About what? There's nothing about... Uh, any debate about any running mate that I'm aware of. People I just, are looking I just to ignore the noise that is going around mm. because it's all I do about nothing. <laughs> I strongly believe, at times I believe that our opponents want to, you know, push some artificial controversy <laughs> within our system, <laughs> hoping that that will be uh, 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 something that will be divided around and we'll be fighting. Okay. But so far they haven't succeeded <laughs> because <laughs> our systems for choosing a running mate are never in doubt. Okay. You see? Mm -hmm. And they are there. They have delivered. And so we are relying on that system to deliver. Okay. So this procedure doesn't include debates in the media about who, <laughs> who is strong, who is weak, who is tall who is uh, female, who is male, and all these things. It's just people making noise to satisfy themselves. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> when I saw the publication that President Mahama has said he will be choosing a male, and it was a banner headline, and so I said, why? Where did this thing come from? And they say it came from his bonotor. Okay. When I was sitting by him all along. <laughs> you didn't hear him say that? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> you understand? So I don't know where these fabrications are coming from. Maybe you but can, you just can. to tell viewers mm. that we have a system of selecting a running mate which has delivered. And we have had no reason to amend our constitution to change it. Okay. So we are relying on that system to deliver a running mate for us in, for the 2024 elections okay. and the system what is the system we believe that even if you have you know two genesis putting them t uh, who who cannot agree with each other mm. putting them in a team to run a government will be a disaster yeah so our system provides a lot of space for the person who has been elected as our flag bearer to have strong inputs as to the choice of our running mate. Okay. So we are not a party that goes out there, collect names and CVs, and prepare a short list for the consideration of the flag bearer. Mm. Okay. If some other parties do that, that is not how we go about ours. Okay. Political marketing strategies say uh, mostly sometimes uh, continuity works mm. uh, uh, some way. Will you continue with your... Give me a moment to, to end this one. <laughs> so, we allow the flag bearer to propose somebody for us. Okay. And then we act like in our traditional setting where a queen mother or somebody proposes a name to the king makers 
then they will evaluate the choice. If there's something wrong with it, if there's overwhelming rejection, yep. we don't go out there to propose our choice. Okay. We tell the Queen Mother, this choice is not acceptable. Okay. Can you bring another, another, one. another one? That is how the NDC system works. Okay. So until our flag bearer proposes a name to us, there's nothing for us to discuss. Okay. And you can't go out there campaigning to become a running mate. Mm -hmm. And so those who are saying, uh, we, we, I mean, there must be a change. It's good to have that debate. Yeah. There are others who are saying there must be continuity. Mm -hmm. It's good to have that debate. But that debate does not influence how we go about our things. Maybe... They are seeking to influence the thinking of the flag bearer in proposing the choice. Okay. Because if it comes to us, and for the sake of argument, the flag bearer decides on continuity and proposes a person. If we have uh, any issues, it is there and then that we raise those issues. Okay. You understand? Mm. But until that proposal comes, there's nothing on the table to discuss. Mm. And those who are discussing, they are not part of the system that generates a running mate for the party. Mm. You have three separate institutions within the party okay. that generates a running mate. Mm. Number one, the flag bearer okay. himself. Mm -hmm. He does the initial step, step okay. by proposing a name. Number two, the council of elders. Of the party. Of the party. Okay. They will assess uh, that nominee and advise the flag bearer. If they reject, it doesn't come to us. Okay. At the national executive, the third one is the yeah. national executive okay. committee. Okay. We constitute the highest decision making body of the party besides Congress. Okay. Okay. Mm. So that is the way it goes. Okay. So if the flag bearer proposes to council of elders and they, they, they hold their consultations and maybe they will reject one and then he will go for another one, reject one, until it scales the council of elders. It doesn't come to National Executive Committee for approval. Okay. Uh -huh. So that is what I, I what know, happens. I mean, the, some of these things, they come with lobbying and all of that. Have people already started lobbying for it? If you lobby me, I'll tell you, <laughs> uh, if your name comes, <laughs> maybe that is where I have to contribute to the decision making. Okay. But your lobbying me does not contribute in ensuring that your name will come. Okay. Because I have no control over the name that will come. Mm. Mm -hmm. And if you lobby Council of Elders, they also don't have any control about the name that will come. Okay. So if you want to lobby, the subject of the lobby should be President John Dramani Mahama. Mm. Go to him and lobby. Okay. Don't waste your time in organizing opinion pools. <laughs> And, uh, 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 asking <laughs> press to debate or anything. Well, what <laughs> would you look out for in a running mate that you think qualifies to run along your candidate? First of all, the person, as I have said, the person who can coexist and work with a running mate, uh, uh, with the flag bearer. The flag bearer. Uh, again, the person who has the competence to do the job. Then you come to, uh, I mean, attraction of votes and, and, and all that. Those are the things because if you are competent to do the job and you cannot uh, put yourself in power, mm. then you remain a candidate. <laughs> you understand? Okay. And so the three ingredients are very, very important. Mm. Ability to do the job. Okay. Being able to uh, work harmoniously with uh, the key person. Okay. And then the attraction of the necessary votes to be able to put the government in power. But when we talk about attracting votes, 
it is not if there is any role to play by the running mate or something it's complementary because the running mate's face doesn't appear on the ballot paper sure so if you have a bad candidate mm -hmm. <laughs> no running mate can rescue your chances of uh, winning power. Of winning power. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the focus is not on, on running mate per se. Okay. But the focus must be on the flag bearer. That is why I am not spending sleepless nights thinking about who the running mate will be and, and all that. My primary focus is how to make President Mahama win the elections. Okay. With or without. <laughs> Even a running mate. <laughs> so <laughs> that is why the timing of our selection of running mate and so on has not been provided for in our constitution at all. Okay. The focus is on who becomes the president. Finally, on this leg, before mm. we get into your skin proper, mm -hmm. I definitely can't do this without picking your thoughts on this uh, import restriction ally that mm. is causing so much controversy in mm. Parliament. Mm. Your people say they will not give in. Mm. Well, he has opportunity. I mean, the trade minister to lay it again on Thursday. Will mm. your people support it? Well, I don't control my side of parliament as an individual. Okay. There are uh, ways and means of ensuring that at times we bring about a whip. That this one goes to the, it strikes the core of our cardinal principles. Principal. So if you are a true NDC person, we must either support it or reject it. This one is not one of them. Okay. And so the MPs themselves are meeting and evaluating those policy proposals and, and so on. So we have not had a meeting per se to issue a one line whip, two right. line whip, or three line whip as things stand now. Okay. But I understand some of the issues that are being brought up. For me, any way of ensuring that we eat what we produce and produce what we eat is a good policy. Definitely. Because when you are trading with others, your food, your everything is in the hands of other people. Yeah. outside your control. Mm -hmm. You cannot claim to be <laughs> economically independent. Yeah. There could be crisis between you and the supplier of your food. And that could spell doom. And then you will be in trouble. So there is every good thing to say about self-sufficiency, a certain minimum level of self-sufficiency in every economy. Yeah. So any policy that will boost local production and limit exports is potentially a good policy. How you go about it is my issue. Okay. So if I can get up one morning and see that Ghana is not importing poultry at all. Okay. Or Ghana is not importing rice at all. And there is no shortage of rice in the system. I'll be happy. <laughs> or there is no poultry in the system. I'll be happy. Yeah. But you can achieve these things artificially. There is a way to go about it that will deliver policy outcomes that are even worse than the current state. So my focus really has to do with 
the approach. The use of import licenses yeah. is a potentially dangerous tool to seek to achieve the results of reducing imports and, and all that. Import licensing itself is not a good tool at all, which I will support anywhere. Okay. Because import licensing implies that there's somebody sitting somewhere who decides not only how much of those particular goods that will come in, but will actually decide who will be given the license to import those goods. And it's a huge opportunity for rent seeking, for people making money without working. Mm. And the impact comes to bear on all of us. The minister says that's not the notion at all. No, and that's why I'm saying his intentions may be good. But we have tried this thing before, and the results it has delivered force us to abandon that one. This is not the first time we are dealing with import uh, licenses. True. Sure. We have dealt with them during the First Republic. I think there was somebody who was a minister, if I can recall it, called Amma or something, who hmm. <laughs> was in charge of issuing import licenses. Okay. Then that became the means, huge means of corruption and rent seeking. Mm. So after the overthrow of the First Republic, there was a whole commission set up to investigate this thing. And the report, I still have a copy of the report. It was horrible. Okay. So, if I, I think it was under just, I don't remember, I don't want to get it wrong. I thought we lay new commission. There were several commissions. Uh, the Munufi Commission was set up to look at how trade unions raise monies and spend them and all that. And then there was a new commission, there was many other commissions. But one of such commissions focused on the import licensing regimes under the First Republic, and the report was horrible. Mm -hmm. Then, some, and it happens, it's preceded by a situation where you have economic, some economic challenges. So the First Republic one happened at a time where we took over from the, the British, ran our own system, and tried to implement economic recovery program, import substitution, and all that. Mm. And then it came to a point where the West saw that Nkrumah was confronting them in certain ways, and that Nkrumah was working against their interests in his effort to seek economic reliance. Okay. So it was then shortages started. They started squeezing us, found ways of bringing down the price of our main export produ uh, product, cocoa, and, and all that. So we started with import licensing. And then a minister was put in charge of that one. So practically, what happened is that the minister will issue the cheat or a license to his favorites. As those who? As those who have the license to import something. To import. They themselves may not be businessmen at all, but they are benefiting because of their closeness to With power. The power. Then they get the licenses, and they go and trade the licenses off to the importers. Okay. Or it could be trading after trading after trading. So the person who actually will be importing may be the third party. Wow. And at each stage that you are trading the license, somebody is screaming off money without working. Wow. So the only thing the person, uh, uh, that gives the person money is that of his closeness to power. To power. So you have 
productivity being replaced with rent seeking. You can easily, if you know one minister, blah, 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 blah and excuse my language, very uh, pretty lady, you can go parade yourself around the minister, oh, get a license, you take it, then you can go trade it to sure. another person, trade it to the third person, and then you get your money instant. Mm. Whether the goods get imported or not, it's, it's not your problem. Business. And then when the goods eventually get imported in the system, you are creating two forces that will all impact on the ordinary citizen. Mm. One force is the, uh, that pushes price to escalate. Is the number of rounds the license, the hands, the license has changed yeah. before getting to the rear importer. Mm -hmm. At each stage, monies are paid. So all that becomes cost that will be added on the product that is being imported. Yeah. You understand? Mm. The second point is that you have created a monopoly. No proper competition. So a certain selected people, either monopoly or oligopoly. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> they are the people who are important. So if once you want it, you must get it from them. Yeah. You understand? So those who actually get something that is restricted in the system, they will also begin adding on, because there is shortage of that mm -hmm. item, mm -hmm. and so on. So that was what happens. And uh, during the Nkomat, one of the findings was that it was used as a means of creaming of money to finance the CPP party. Okay. Is there not a party in power now? <laughs> so you suspect so that. Is that what, uh, but when <laughs> they mess up with, uh, <laughs> with Galamsey, mm. then to hear some of their top men saying that party here is Okay. And that was why <laughs> they were doing the supporting some of their people in Galamsey. So, so you this had suggested is that this could then be yes. Then a we way came of to cashing in for the party. Yes. Then when Nkrumah was overthrown, uh, NLC came to power. Import licenses were abolished. People could bring everything. Then they handed over to Buzia. That system continued. Then Buzia was overthrown. And a champion declared Yentia means that we won't pay our debts. Like what we are in now. Yeah. Today the system is Yentimintia. We can't <laughs> pay. <laughs> but during a champion's time, say Yentia, <laughs> we are not paying because you gave the loans, knowing very well that the people who are handling it are wrong people who will not work in our interest. So we are not going to pay. pay. You bear the responsibility, so we are not going to pay. Today, our donors are not saying that. The government says there is absolutely no money to pay. <laughs> Even if the willingness to pay is there, the money is not, there. not there. So we are in a similar situation. So that force a champion to go into import licensing again. And the results was what generated what we used to call in this country, Kalabule. Yeah. That was the cause, import licensing. Because mm -hmm. there was shortage. And so we had money to import this much. And so we must select uh, uh, which people will import and then we allocate the licenses to them to import. So in a champion style, those who were closer to power, who had the opportunity to get the, get license. the license. Were the only people? Yes, and they were being led by pretty, pretty ladies. <laughs> <laughs> so if you read the books, during a champion's time, there was something we call foul, to golf. Okay, I heard about that. It came from this import licensing region. <laughs> <laughs> you see? So if we are talking about import licensing, it's a very dangerous 
thing. Mm. If we want to reduce imports of certain goods, there are several other means of doing it, which becomes transparent, which is available to everybody. Mm. Okay. If you ask me, where should we start with the uh, cutting down the importation of rice? Mm. Number one, you can generate our own demand for local rice by directing that government's huge purchasing power for these items must be utilized on locally produced rice. You know the amount of rice government as government buys in this country. Yeah. That could be a starting point. Mm -hmm. Government buys rice to feed school children throughout the country. True. Government buys rice to feed the security system. True. Uh, uh, armies and all those. Government buys rice to feed prisoners Prisons. and all that. So the government and then all the senior boarding, senior high schools, universities, and so on. So if there is a deliberate policy that, look, no imported rice should be procured with a peswa of state resources, unless we can prove that there is no local rice. And then government focuses and makes its purchasing power available for local producers of rice. That is one step. You can also look at telling to, making a policy that those who are import, major importers of rice, if you want to import rice from the beginning, begin in investing on local production. Even if you are not going to establish farms, the first step is come and install rice milling facilities in Ghana. Okay. Then all rice that will be imported in Ghana must be paddy. Mm -hmm. Bring it and let the milling happen here. Don't we carry our cocoa to them? Yeah. Eh? Bring the, 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 the paddy rice. Let us mill here. The milling processes actually generate jobs. There are byproducts that can be used for feeding of livestock and other things. So that is one way. So you get the milling capacity that can uh, deal with all the demands in the country. Mm. So whilst local ones are milling locally produced rice, your imported rice must come in on milled form, come and be doing the milling here. So as you are milling, and we are encouraging people to produce a certain, we can bring technology, determine which variety or varieties of rice will be produced in which area. Yeah. Because if you are producing rice and there are admixtures, the same combined harvester will go and harvest uh, <laughs> rice of this variety, goes to another person's farm and harvest <laughs> within a year, when you get a bowl of rice, you can pick grains of more than 15 varieties in one bowl. Mm. That's not good rice yeah. to be proud of. So you can determine the variety of rice we are going to produce. And the milling companies can actually suggest or help us to get the rice that we can propagate. So we will be doing backwards integration up to farm level. Yeah. So if there is a milling facility and government has a deliberate policy or government plus that uh, miller can do uh, you know outgrow a farming system where you have a mill so there is credit and other facilities and good uh, seeds for planting good uh, 
you know, extension services mm. and all that farm input and all that mechanization services and so on. Mm. And they produce and what they produce are bought off at farm gate and brought to the mill. Mm. That's how we can move to a point where Ghana becomes self-sustainable. If you go and cut the thing now, whether we, we need, and in all this, you need numbers, actual hard data to drive that, that intervention. Yeah. Okay, so these are some of the things. I, so basically, my beef is about how to get the self sufficiency, sufficiency. Mm -hmm. it cannot be done mechanically through import licensing there are many other ways of doing it other countries if they don't want, want to if they want to reduce the amount of our cocoa they buy they do their research you'll be here they will tell you that japan says there is chemical residue in <laughs> your cocoa. <laughs> if you don't do it this way, we are not buying. Right. Yeah. Okay. You employ, uh, what do you call it? Prison labor or child labor in producing this thing. So because of that, you cannot, uh, we cannot buy your, there are many, many other ways of doing it. Mm. But not through import licensing. <laughs> My problem is the import licensing because of our history as a country with import licensing. Johnson, I see you doing here. Also known as General Mosquito, he's so my guest tonight. He is the chairman of the NDC. Probably you've only seen him as General Secretary of the NDC. And you've, you've, you've followed him as chairman, a very strong one at that. But did you know that he's a trained teacher, a trained banker, and a stockbroker? When we return from this break, he will be telling us more about this career before he ventured into politics. Growing up, did he even know that he was going to be a politician? What did he be, want to become as a young chap? And he would also be sharing some very interesting moments growing up in Sekwa in the Bono region. Stay with me. I'm coming right back. Welcome back to PM Personality Profile. My guest to uh, Johnson Asiye Dunketia, Chairman of the National Democratic Congress. I know you hail from Sekwa. Is that where you were born? Yes. General. Um, and both parents are from Sekwa? Yes. You grew up there? I grew up there. It used yeah. to be in the Ashanti region, now it's, yeah, it's Bono region. Bono, and it used to be in Wenchi district, now it's in Tain district. Okay. A through and through Sekwa Village boy, boy. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. You know, because of our uh, culture and traditions, mm. uh, I didn't grow up living so much with my parents. My uncles were by those standards, very rich cocoa farmers. Okay. And uh, <laughs> in the absence of uh, banking in those areas, they were like the money lenders and all that. Uh -huh. I see. So, and my mother was their only sister okay. among about six siblings. Okay, she was the only girl. Yes. Okay. So we're seen as uh, royals who were being prepared for some future great inheritance okay. and, and so on. Okay, you're from the royal family, actually. Well, from the Akwamu royal family. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it was like even going to school will not give them the opportunity to train you properly. Okay. So I almost didn't Go get the opportunity school. of going to school. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yes. And my uncles were rich. So all that my parents need to do is just to produce a child. Mm -hmm. And then uh, three years, four years, five years, you are weeks away from them. 
and then and one of your uncles, you. your uncles take care of you. So you live with your uncles, wives, and other things. That so they start training you. Okay. And so that was what happened to me. So at a point, I, all my colleagues, of, of the same age, age yeah. were being sent to school, but I was not being sent to school. <laughs> at what age was at that? One, they reached six years. Okay. The reason being my smallish stature. Okay, so and you so those days you have to pass your hand over <laughs> your head. Okay. You're able to touch your ear, then you are mature to, to go, go to, to school. school. <laughs> <laughs> That's but me I never got the opportunity of being tried at <laughs> all because <laughs> <laughs> because it was a deliberate policy that we should not go to school. Okay. And that they could see that I'll be a very focused person. Okay. And so they have to train me among my siblings. I have to be trained to inherit my uncle's cocoa farms. Mm. And so I was, up, so I grew up on farm. Okay. And so I never learned agriculture in any uh, institution of study. Okay. But I was born on a cocoa farm and grew up in a cocoa farm and, and all that. So until I was uh, arrested one day on the street when everybody else had gone to school <laughs> by the Young Pioneer Movement. Okay, for what? CPP. Offense. There was free, compulsory, okay. universal, basic education. Yep. So it was an offense, <laughs> a criminal <laughs> offense, <laughs> if you refuse to send your child to school. They can pick the child and trace the parents and prosecute them. Okay. Uh, so okay. that was how so I was they arrested picked you and up took you to your parents. in the evening. <laughs> the young Panyan people went to my, 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 uncle. my uncles and said, he must go to school or you guys will go to jail. Uh -huh. So that was... <laughs> <laughs> what rescued you? That was how I went to school. That is why every... Birthday of Nkrumah, yeah. wherever it is celebrated, I go there to participate. A F cube was actually <laughs> F cube. You see, free, compulsory, yeah. universal basic education. Yeah. And the reason was that they had provided all what it takes to, to send to their school. child to school without paying money. So you had no excuse. So you have no excuse. And so you can be prosecuted. For not going. Uh -huh. Yeah. But <laughs> in this modern <laughs> days, <laughs> the F cube. The money the parents will still have to cough up before they can take advantage of it. You cannot have any justification in prosecuting them. But in Krumah's time, it wasn't <laughs> like that. So there was justification to prosecute. So I was picked and sent to school. And from day one, I started topping the class. Oh, wow. At the Serkwa Presbyterian yes, School, right? Yes, yes. So you started... Uh, so at what age were you still six or six you, years. You, you, you were yes, more yes, than six, six years. years? And in those days, because of my intellect, mm. I could have finished school in say eight or seven years. Okay. Because there are opportunities to upgrade exceptionally brilliant students. Okay. So they will go mid year, they will come and conduct some test okay. in every class mm -hmm. to identify exceptionally good students for promotion to the next grade, even though the year had not ended. Okay. Okay. Mm. Each time they come to my class, I will talk. Okay. But they look at me and say, he's too small. <laughs> then, <laughs> you are then they will, with they your will, then they will, they will upgrade the one who came second, third, and fourth, and leave, and, uh, and leave me oh there. Oh my goodness. So I had to do the whole <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> and then when I was in middle school, that was where you do common entrance. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. My teachers knew about my performance. Some of them would go out of their way to register common entrance behind the backs of my uncles. Okay. I'll go and write. In those days, when you write, you can earn scholarship even before you go to the school. Oh, wow. They look at your marks and write to you that you have passed, you have been admitted here, and you are coming on full scholarship. Okay. I got that one about twice. I see. But 
You, they, you can't go to school without, you, I can't escape from the house. Wow. And then when you go home and tell, the teachers go to tell your uncles, my uncles, they won't react immediately. Then they say, okay, we are thinking about it. <laughs> when the teachers leave, lock me up and give me <laughs> good, they whip me properly. For going to oh, write that's the exam. That's a horse whip. <laughs> For going to write the exam. So they must whip me to take this crutchy, crutchy thing out, <laughs> out of, of your out head. Of me. <laughs> you see? So I went through all this. So I had to <laughs> abandon all these opportunities till I finished one four. And I finished one four. Uh, I was like in the house. <laughs> then uh, my teachers, the middle school teachers, come. Oh, can't you come and help us prepare the final year students? Mm -hmm because you are exceptionally good. So I almost go and take over the Form 4 class and be helping, and helping, 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 helping. Okay. In those days, there was, I was forced to go and write the middle school living exams a second time. Okay. And you know what happened. <laughs> oh, tell me. <laughs> I didn't know anything. <laughs> I was there. Then uh, my teachers, as we were going, f we were preparing the students for final distance. Then one brilliant student died. Oops. And when we were getting to Form 4, some of the weak pupils will be adopting names during the exam registration. Mm -hmm. Adopting names. That, that will position them in a certain way in the exams hall so they are closer <laughs> to the brilliant <laughs> <Okay. laughs> person. So they were and even they changing their surnames? If there is, yes. Wow. If there is opportunity to help, then they can they help. They can help them. <laughs> uh -huh. I see. So it happened that they all got certain names, weak, weak people got certain names. So because so brilliant came students. came around a certain guy called Joshua Ade. Okay. Uh, then, before the exam, Joshua Ade died. Oh my goodness. And so how are they going to do it? Our school was one of the best schools, very proud schools in the whole Wenchi district. Okay. We are always among the first ten. Mm. So somehow the teacher said that ah, if Joshua Ade has died, it means that we are getting less than 100% even before we go. For the exams. For the exams. <laughs> So we must get somebody <laughs> to sit in there. <laughs> and help the weak students. <laughs> yes. So they came and begged my parents that they are taking me to go and sit in to write the exams. So they put the school uniform, the khaki Back khaki on, khaki on me. And I was even smaller <laughs> than some of the, <laughs> the final years. People. <laughs> <laughs> See? So I went and wrote. The Even after you the had same, completed the first one, I got distinction. <laughs> then I went and sat in and wrote and assisted all the <laughs> weak people who have been brought around me. And okay. we had 100%, and I still had my distinction. Wow. And after that, I thought I was rotting away. Okay. So I found time to go and do all jobs on the market, pushing trucks. Uh, this uh, cart, yep. carrying people's mm -hmm. uh, luggage to the market and all that. And it was through that that I earned money and bought the form to okay. write the entrance exam to training college. Because your uncles won't they take won't any give of it. that. They, they were giving loans to other people <laughs> to finance their children's education. But for but you... No, we are we royals, we are to going to inherit Cocoa Farm, become chief and all that. <laughs> so, and you know the funny thing, <laughs> when they give you credit to uh, finance your child's education, mm. then you pledge your Cocoa Farm. <laughs> and then they will take over the Cocoa Farm and we go to be harvesting that, <laughs> that Cocoa, cocoa when their children are in school. Imagine. <laughs> you see, so that was... What, so I had to hide to earn my own money through doing all jobs, shoe shining and all these things, to be able to mobilize enough money mm -hmm. to buy 
uh, the form and all that. I still remember. Okay. I, I I think I got 14 CDs. Okay. And the form was nine CDs. Those days, who? Okay. <laughs> The form was nice. It is I bought it and used the rest to Bye. do the photographs and the other things, mm -hmm. process it. Mm -hmm. And then when the time came, I found a way of sneaking away to go and write the exams yeah, in Brekum. Exams. Okay. When I told my mates that, oh, we are writing away, can't we just try our hands in, on, on something? something? Then they say, hey, what have you got here? Uh, four year teacher training <laughs> exams. Hey. Who passes that exam? Oh. And it's true. Some you of our teachers have themselves. done it. Some have done it six times, <laughs> eight times, <laughs> ten <laughs> times. <laughs> they couldn't pass. So even when I was going to write the exam, I went with three of our teachers, people teachers. Who had taught you previously. <laughs> yes. Okay. So we went and wrote. And then I passed with one of the teachers and two of the teachers failed. Oh, goodness. So Somehow we chose the same training college. So I went to T1 mm -hmm. with my teacher. Okay. The one who taught <laughs> you one, primary yeah, school. Well, one of the my teachers. School. So after I had written the exams, I didn't even think that I will get the opportunity of going to the training. I was just trying Your my hands, hands on something. On then before the results came, there was some uh, village quarrel. And then somebody insulted my, one of my uncles that they were useless. Lot of people they have money, but they don't have any scholar in their family. In their family, and <laughs> So my my uncle got so pissed off, yeah, and then came to my mother to get and said, him. "Where is Kwaju? <laughs> I have to take him to, to college." The way this uh, uh, lady has insulted us, <laughs> no, we have to prove that we can <laughs> generate this. So that was our. That was your so luck. when I was told, I came, my mother told me, your uncle had come to look for you. He says he wants to take you to college. I said, hey, it's a trap for me to be beaten. I'm not going. <laughs> then, <laughs> you know, but I was persuaded. So I risked it, I went. He said, you have to go to college. I said, ah, but even just this last uh, three months ago, mm -hmm. I got full scholarship from Common Entrance. They said, you but guys, to go. you beat me when my teachers <laughs> came to tell me. I said, but is it passed? I said, yes, the people are in school already. Mm -hmm. So there was nothing I could do. I said, okay, so can't we pay money anywhere for you to uh -huh. be uh, admitted? <laughs> Whatever it takes. You must be in college. College. I said, okay, the only place you can pay money is for me to apply to these private commercial schools and technical schools and so on. So I'm going to apply. So I apply to, I think, Swedro uh, Commercial or and someone, one of the technical schools and something. Mm. When the application was okay. done, in less than a week, then the postman star came knocking at our door and okay said, I you. have a, a letter. They gave it to me, and it was an uh, admission letter from St. Joseph's Training College that I had passed the, uh, the, exams. the exams. Oh, OK. So they brought it and requested that you attend interview. I'm sure your uncles will be very happy. I went, <laughs> gave it to my uncle. I said, so when you finish that, <laughs> what will you be doing? <laughs> I said, ah, uh, teaching uh, uh, for years. I said, what? You are going to do a uh, Masajumo and Kwasidria's type of work. <laughs> have you have seen them going to school here with the back of their uh, trousers tattered and so on? So we are going to pay money for you to come and be doing this type of thing. <laughs> then that one is no good. It's so good business. I want to take you to where you can become. <laughs> You can become a lawyer, or you can become an engineer, or you can become <laughs> this. So it took some doing well, by me. my teachers. One particular teacher, Mr. Afari, yeah. he persisted and persisted and convinced my uncle that, look, there are opportunities. Once he enters training college, yeah. he can even make progress to from other. there. So try it. 
So that's how I got to my uncle. So even when I was attending interview, he followed me to Bichim. <laughs> and his, uh, some village guy was sitting in front for people to know that he's taking his nephew <laughs> to college. <laughs> and then when I was giving my prospectus, he bought everything from A to Z, not even a needle was left out. Okay. And then my trunk was on top of the <laughs> village car and then paying the For same. everybody to see that you're going that to college. Kwame says nephew <laughs> is going to college now. So <laughs> <laughs> and in fact the shoes that were the first shoe that was bought for me. I didn't know how to wear shoes. Goodness. Because so I had to put on the shoe and practice walking in the night. <laughs> <laughs> That's the life we have gone through. I see. Today, <laughs> <laughs> six months old child is at the back of the mother. Is the shoe. <laughs> you see, so all these things happened. And I went to school. When I went to the training college, the problem didn't end. I went there and I was like, the youngest and the smallest person on campus. Yeah. So many of the the senior husband has told me and say, ah, hey, small boy, what do you want here? <laughs> Don't you see that the exact time is over? Whose box did you carry? Whose job box did you so carry? Bring it. I say, say you have I, to I go am back. A, I am a student <laughs> too. Say, who admitted you <laughs> to? Don't you know that Saint Joseph's is for men? You <laughs> Not know? boys. Not boys. <laughs> so, but eventually. <laughs> this my small head helped me. Okay. You know, when classes started and so on, and then we were now separating the Boy Scout from the soldiers. <laughs> and uh, there too, I started uh, topping the class. Wow. And then, so that was what saved me. All the seniors were molesting me and punishing me until. But why? Because I was easy, I cannot resist. <laughs> So, <laughs> I was easy to be beaten by anybody. <laughs> then what saved me, they were introducing modern mathematics okay. in the school. And we are supposed to be teachers, trained teachers, who will learn and then come and teach okay. the new curriculum. Yeah, and so, they said, all training colleges, by force we must all learn, they are beginning uh, this modern math from this academic year. Mm -hmm. So those who were in final year, we have to change from the traditional uh, arithmetic to learn this modern math and use it to write their final exam. Okay. Those from third year uh, will learn for uh, one and a half years. Those uh, second year will learn three years. And we were lucky to be in first year, so they will start with us. Okay. But they adopted a policy of taking all of the first term, taking all of us through with the same syllabus going at the same pace. Okay. So after the first term, they will now stagger, and those who are in final year will move faster and all that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they did that. And then at the end of the term, we wrote the same exams, the whole school. Okay. When the results came, I had topped the whole school. Wow. <laughs> Small boy danger. So <laughs> the first reaction, <laughs> was that senior prefect and that the others, they went and saw the resources. Ah. This small boy has disgraced us. <laughs> come, come and look, at, look for him. So they brought me, took me to uh, uh, T4. Come on, kneel down. Kneel down <laughs> on Instead of some gravel you. and they put some, uh, these things, stones. I was kneeling down with stones. In Where my do people get punished for passing exams? <laughs> because a T4 person should have <laughs> come to <laughs> a knife of TY I just came <laughs> one night. So that was what happened to me. <laughs> but one one of my seniors, I think he, he must be from Bulsa area. He's called senior Abalansa AJS. Okay. He entered the room and saw me kneeling down, weeping, holding this. Then he asked them, what has happened? What are you doing to teach us more? <laughs> 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 teach us more. So, ah, then they told him, having to gone to the notice board, 
<laughs> he has disgraced all of us, including senior prefect, including everybody. I say what? So he came top of the mass exams, the whole school. I say, and you are punishing him. Ah. Those days, if you <laughs> fail the final exam, you can't get your your back pay. When you come out of training college, they give you half of your pay okay. awaiting the results. The results. When you, when feel, you pass, forget then it. they bring all oh. the back pay. It uh -huh. is what you use to buy your furniture and other things to start your life. Your life. Okay. You say, ah, you want us to forfeit our back pay? <laughs> if you are lucky, these things they have brought, we don't understand. If you have somebody here who understands, who can help you to pass and get your back pay, you are punishing You are punishing the person. <laughs> So he went and, and, and drew a machete. I said, look, let me see anybody trying to punish this. I'll show you the inside of your stomach. That Help me out, get out. Savior. So he saved me. In the evening, he took me across all the dormitories, warning everybody that I should not be touched by anybody. So from there, I got independent. Nobody should Untouchable. touch me. Because they all feared senior balancer. Okay. Uh -huh. So... Even in the house, Mark house and the others, I wasn't even doing sweeping or cleaning Nobody or anything could again. Even come close so they formed four people, formed steady groups. Okay. And I'll go and participate and help them with the so, mass. Okay. You know. And yeah. that helped me too. Because if we attend those study groups and I'm not able to solve the problems that they are bringing. Mm -hmm. It means I may forfeit that freedom I'm enjoying. <laughs> so I had to study extra. All night. <laughs> All night. So I was above my class <laughs> in mass. So that you can enjoy your freedom. Uh, yeah. So that was <laughs> So St. Joseph's days were very interesting. <laughs> so that's how I got there. When I finished, I bought a syllabus for O-level and then came to Accra, bought books, and then wrote the O-level, hmm. private. Okay. I got aggregate one. Okay. And then I, the following year, I bought syllabus for A-level to study, and then I went and wrote the A-level. I passed, and I got admitted to School of Administration, University uh, of Ghana. University and that of was, Ghana. Uh -huh, okay. And that was how... I, I I then departed <laughs> briefly from the teaching. Johnson, I said, okay, I'm grateful and thank, thank you, you so much for opening up to us. You're we welcome. thank you so much for the good work you're doing for Mother Ghana. We thank admire you. you a lot and thank we you. learn a lot from you. Keep up the good work. <laughs> thank you. I'm most grateful. <laughs> Viewers, thank you so much for watching. Same time next week, we'll be bringing you another edition of PM Personality Profile. My name is Aishi Ryan. Definitely, this interview will be played in two parts. The first part, you heard him talk about his, uh, the party that he supervises and also talking about his growing up and his contribution to the party. Next week, same time, we'll be bringing you part two of this interview where we delve deep into his career before venturing into politics. We'll also be sharing with us some interesting moments in his political career to enjoy the rest of our programs. <music>